Um, I'm so happy for all of us to be here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I want to um, say we're going to be joined in a few minutes by Congressman Jim McGovern, who has devoted the last 40 years working on the issue of justice in Latin America. Peter Edelman is here, who's a member of the RFK Human Rights Board and who worked so closely with Gabby on um, Indian rights here in the United States and across the world. Um, we have Congress, Congresswoman Williams is coming, Congressman Cory Bush is coming, uh, Ambassador Jonadav Chowdhury is here from the Muskogee Creek Nation. Thank you so much for joining us, Ambassador. Uh, my brother-in-law, Dave McCain, is with us. And I want to just ask um, briefly Congressman Greg Stanton of Arizona to come and say a few words of welcome. Thank you, everyone. What an honor to be here for this special occasion. Carrie Kennedy and the Kennedy family, thank you for what you do to keep the light of uh, Robert Kennedy shining so bright. And I'm from Arizona. Robert Kennedy is, of course, loved, beloved in Arizona in part because when Cesar Chavez was fighting so hard for farm worker rights and was on a um, long-term fast in downtown Phoenix, Arizona, where I used to be the mayor of, um, he was doing it, not getting a lot of attention, and Robert Kennedy came and visited him and fasted with him for a period of time and raised the issue of farm worker rights to a national consciousness in a way that almost no one else could. And so this is a very special uh, award and at a time when the United States needs to keep being a leader on human rights around the globe. This award for this particular organization, Fighting for Human Rights in Guatemala, is very uh, important. This, the Western Hemisphere, you mentioned with McGovern, who spend, has spent so much time as a leader on uh, the United States relationship with uh, other countries in the Western Hemisphere, which has been long ignored. This shines a light out in a way to remind us human rights around the globe and our hemisphere is so important. So thank you for letting me uh, be here and thank you for this uh, prestigious award for this important organization and for shining the light on the legacy of Robert Kennedy. Thank you. And um, we're so happy to have Gil Everts here from the RFP Leadership Council, so thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, good morning. My name is Tisawaki. I am a proud member of the Comanche tribe. I'm also known as Mokoche Washte Win by my Lakota Sioux brothers and sisters. When I was six years old, my father went around the dinner table and asked every one of my brothers and sisters what we wanted to be when we grew up. Uh, one said a vet, another said a teacher, another said president of the United States. But when it came to me, I said, I want to be an Indian. As Attorney General, Daddy was in charge of the Lands Division, a section of the Justice Department, which for 185 years opposed Indian land claims. My father went to the head of the division and said, from now on, our goal is to pay those Indian land claims. Later, when he was elected Senator of New York, he discovered that New York had the eighth largest population of Indians among the 50 states. And as a senator, he visited what remained of every single reservation. Daddy worked with LaDonna Harris and her hu husband, Senator Fred Harris, supporting the Oklahomans for Indian opportunity. As senator, he established the Senate Subcommittee on Indian Education. And in the midst of his presidential campaign, to the dismay of his political staff, who thought he should be spending time in other areas where mo more voters would meet him, he took a full day detour and visited the impoverished children of Pine Ridge in South Dakota. He was proud to report that he got all but one vote on that reservation. 
and legend has it that voter claimed he had marked the wrong ballot by mistake. Daddy made a point of visiting the monument to those massacred Lakotas at Wounded Knee. At the Blackfoot Reservation in Idaho, he told us later at the dinner table, he saw only one book about Indian history and culture in the schools. For my father, this was about justice denied. He expressed his outrage at, quote, the first American being the last American in terms of employment, health, and education, unquote. He brought the stories of the people he met and their unacceptable living conditions back to the dinner table and the Indian leaders to our home. He talked about their history. He talked about their pride. He talked about their extraordinary contributions to our country and their rich and deep culture. So my response as a six-year-old was not as unusual as it may seem. For my sixth birthday, Daddy's Comanche friends formally inducted me into the tribe and named me Tisawaki, one who looks for the best in everything. I'm also known as Carrie Kennedy, and, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 40th annual Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Awards. Before we get started, please give a warm welcome to one of the leading lawyers advocating for tribal sovereignty and one of our country's most produced native playwrights, RFK Human Rights, Award, Human Rights Board member, Mary Catherine Nagel. Thank you, Carrie. It's an honor to be here today. My name is Mary Catherine. I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, and I am very honored to serve on the RFK board. I am also honored to be here today with my husband, Jonadev Padre, who serves as the ambassador for the Muskogee Creek Nation. Over, just over, well, actually, just under, I do math, 200 years ago, our nations and many more were forcibly removed from the southeastern part of the United States. A lot of Americans do know at least that piece of the history, so there's a lot of our collective history that they don't understand or know. And when school children learn about the portrayals of tears that forcibly removed our families and our nations, I think today most people say never again. I think most Americans agree that that was a bad thing to do. Why were we removed? Well, there was a purpose behind the removal. Commerce. At the time of our removal, gold was discovered on our reservation nation, and other forms of commerce that different companies in the Southeast wanted to expand to cause slavery, other things, and our nations stood in the way. So we were forcibly removed, despite the fact that my nation, the Cherokee Nation, had won a very significant case in the United States Supreme Court in 1832, where Chief Justice Marshall wrote that no other sovereign except Cherokee Nation could exercise jurisdiction on our land, and the state of Georgia was without any power to remove us or force us home. But the president at that time, Andrew Jackson, refused to enforce that decision. And so it was through government sanctioned violence that we were forcibly removed. The problem is, is that this practice continues today against the jurisdictions here in the United States, like what we saw at Standard Rock in 2016 when the Dakota Access Pipeline used its own corporate military to literally bulldoze 27 burials that stood in the path of a pipeline and break federal law and destroy native sacred sites and burial grounds. And with our brothers and sisters down in Guatemala who are fighting a mining company today under very similar circumstances to what our people fought just less than 200 years ago. So I think what it means to truly be American today is we have to think about our past, but we also have to look and how it presents itself in our current times. And are we going to be those people who, at the time of Andrew Jackson, turned and looked the other way and didn't do anything to stop the trails of tears that forcibly removed our nations? Or are we going to stand up as American citizens and take responsibility for our role in the world? And that's why I'm very honored to serve on the RFK board, because what happened to our people, let's be honest, still happens today. It was 2020 when the state of Oklahoma asked the United States Supreme Court to abolish my husband's reservation because they didn't like that the Muskogee Reservation still exists today, despite the fact that his nation signed a treaty in 1866 to create that reservation. 
So we still have to defend our sovereignty, our rights as indigenous nations that predate the United States, but we also have to explore our role in the international community. And what are we doing to hold those corporations and other governments accountable when they attempt to repeat the playbook that our United States government created in the 1700s and the 1800s? So I thank you all for being here today. It's an honor to, to serve on this board, and I couldn't agree more with the selection and the recipient of this year's RFK Human Rights Award. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Catherine. We are here to honor the Shinka Parliament, which champions the cause of the Shinka people, the second largest indigenous group of Guatemala. Please welcome Alisar, Arena, Irma, Pachico, Kelvin, Jimenez, and Luis Fernando Garcia. And the Chinka Parliament. I also want to recognize Lynn Delaney, our extraordinary executive director who's worked with us for 40 years, members of our international advisory uh, advocacy and litigation team, Wade McMullen, Angelita Bayans, whose vision and spirit is what brings us here today, Sophia Haraimo, Isabel Roby, Ipichuku Uzoma, uh, Sarah Morsheimer, Christy Weda, and most especially Ugo, Ugo Isa, who has been a superstar organizer, and also everyone who worked so hard to, on today's program, and all the members of the RFK Human Rights staff. So thank you. It, it is an honor to stand with you as we pay tribute to those who've shown unwavering commitment and courage in their fight for justice, quality, and the protection of human rights. Thank you all for joining us here at the Kennedy Caucus Room, the place where both Senator John F. Kennedy and Senator Robert F. Kennedy spoke those immortal words. Today, I am announcing my candidacy for the presidency of the United States. Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights was founded by my father's family and friends in 1968 to carry forward his unfinished work on social justice. Since our inception, RFK Human Rights has been committed to the rights of indigenous people. The first year of our existence, RFK Human Rights helped found the first Indian school where the tribal language was taught and read. For the last three decades, RFK Human Rights has worked alongside our partners in Guatemala, advancing access to justice, establishing accountability for those who commit wrongs, and confronting and stopping racism. As part of our long-term commitment, we are honored to present the RFK Human Rights Award today to the Shinka Parliament. In 1990, we presented the RFK Human Rights Award to Emil Carmendez, the courageous activist who organized Mayan indigenous people targeted by the military scorched earth campaign, which raised thousands of villages to the ground and murdered over 166,000 Mayan women, children, and men. By 1996, Guatemalan indigenous leaders and the RFK Speak Truth to Power laureate, Rigoberto Menchu, had won the Nobel Peace Prize. The peace accords were signed in Guatemala and the internal armed conflict was officially over. Guatemala, like other countries in Central America, was slowly transitioning to democracy. In short order, though, the strides that were made to combat corruption and impunity and strengthen the rule of law in Guatemala were systematically dismantled by an alliance of political, military, and business leaders colluding to enrich themselves and suppress democratic reforms. 
This evil crusade expelled the UN-backed International Anti-Corruption Commission and imprisoned or forced into exile dozens of leading judges, prosecutors, lawyers, activists, and journalists. Today, the unfulfilled promise of justice, equality, and human rights for historically marginalized indigenous populations remains as elusive as it was during the internal armed conflict, and criminals in high office abuse power without accountability. To understand the reality of what it means to be indigenous in Guatemala, Guatemala it is vital to gain an understanding of justice across Central America. To shed light on this, I would like to welcome our keynote speaker. Kevin Sullivan is the Pulitzer Prize winning senior correspondent and associate editor of the Washington Post. He has reported from more than 75 countries on six continents. Kevin and his wife, Mary Jordan, were the Post Co Bureau Chiefs in Tokyo, Mexico City, and London. They won the 2003 Pulitzer Prize for international reporting for their coverage of the Mexican justice system. One of their articles featured the 2010 RFK Human Rights Award Laureate, Abel Barrera. Please welcome Kevin. Good morning. Um, I am very proud to be here at this event that honors the, the life and the work of Robert F. Kennedy. Um, he's such a great man, and especially in this historic room that celebrates the three Kennedy brothers who served in the Senate. Um, and more than that, I'm, I'm also happy to be here on this, this, this very important day uh, in, in the Kennedy family history, uh, which this award has turned from, taken from tragedy and turned it into triumph and hope, and that's a wonderful thing. Congratulations, Kerry. I'm especially also happy to be here with my old friend, Kerry Kennedy, um, who has worked so hard to, to preserve and to enhance and to advance the, the work that her father did. Um, your, your dad would be very proud of her, of his rock star daughter. Um, as Kerry mentioned, my wife, Mary Jordan, and I were the Washington Post Bureau Chiefs in Mexico for five years, uh, with responsibility for covering Mexico, Central America, and much of the Caribbean. We traveled all throughout the region during those years, uh, spent a lot of time in Guatemala, Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, just about everywhere from Tijuana to Caracas, really. Um, we came to know the people of those countries and we came to love them very, very much, uh, not necessarily their governments. Um, Mary and I have been always guided in our journalism by a sense of justice, of giving voice to people who have none and of looking out for the little guy. We saw so much injustice in Latin America and we met amazing people who fought against it, just as the Shinka parliament has done so bravely and so effectively. On one trip to Guatemala, we met the wonderful Helen Mack, who turned to activism when her sister Myrna was killed by the Guatemalan military in 1990. She's still out there doing it today. Um, I interviewed her in 2003 when the former dictator, Efrain Rios Montt, was incredibly running for president despite all the bloodshed and brutality in his past. I interviewed Rios Montt too. Uh, who at the time was a member of Congress, so he enjoyed Im immunity from prosecution, which was a very handy thing for that man. Um, he told me that he knew many people considered him a devil. But I'm not, he told me. Do you want me to start crying or get gastritis about it? I'm not a devil. If I were, I wouldn't be here. So I went to Helen Mack and told her what he had said. And um, she just shook her head about Rio Rios Mont and the other dinosaurs left over from those days. They really are Jurassic, she said. Their thinking hasn't changed since the 1980s, and that is why we are going backwards. We saw that over and over again. Governments changed, leaders changed. If there was progress, then there wasn't. The thing that struck us most was how much things just stayed the same. Inertia was often the biggest obstacle to any progress at all. The status quo seemed like a huge boulder. People kept trying to pick it up and move it, but the thing just wouldn't move. Uh, in Mexico, we wrote extensively about the criminal justice system, uh, justice for women, justice for children, justice for poor people, justice for indigenous people, environmental justice, and justice in rural areas. There are thousands of tiny villages and hamlets far from the nearest paved road in Mexico where hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people actually, um, live. In places like, a little place like a village called Dos Rios, where we visited. 
It's a dusty little wisp of a village on a mountainside in Guerrero State. Fewer than 400 people live there. There's no electricity, not a light, not a light bulb in the, whole, in the whole town. The only vehicle is an old Ford pickup truck. A priest comes once a year to say mass. And police almost never bother going there. The government says it's simply too expensive to run roads and electric lines to places like Dos Rios, let alone provide police, prosecutors, judges, any kind of a system of justice. As a result, millions of Mexicans live in places that remain largely beyond the law. In Dos Rios, six old men who run the community decide what the law is. I had heard a story from a local human rights group. I think, that, I think it was Adele um, Gary. And they said they couldn't confirm it, but it sounded like exactly the kind of case I was looking for to illustrate the problems with rural justice in Mexico. So I decided to go see for myself, and I drove out to Dos Rios, which is 12 hours from Mexico City. And here's what I found. One night, two men in the village who had grown up like brothers together in the same house got drunk, got into an argument over absolutely nothing probably, and one stabbed the other to death, two quick jabs to the heart. The elders had to decide on a punishment. Here's what they came up with. They decided to bury them both, one dead and one alive. Local men dug a grave, the whole town marched out to the cemetery, they lowered the dead man's coffin into the hole, then they hogtied the killer and threw him in on top too. As his 14-year-old son reached for him and tried to pull him out, and as his mother watched in horror, they shoveled dirt into the hole until he disappeared. When they finished, his mother told me, you could still hear him screaming under the ground. My arrival in town startled everyone. Uh, I was in a big white van with a photographer and a translator who spoke the local indigenous language. Nobody ever came to Dos Rios, certainly not someone with notebooks and cameras. So this triggered an emergency meeting of the elders who gathered in the little dirt town square and asked us to sit along with most of the other villagers who had shown up for this weird event uh, um, and they said, welcome to Dos Rios, how can we help you? So I decided to give it a try. Um, I explained that I was writing about how hard it was to live in a place without any formal justice system, where local people have to decide what justice is. I told them I had heard a rumor about someone being buried alive here. They started speaking among themselves. Five minutes, 10, 15. There was a big argument going on in a language I didn't understand. So I asked the translator, what's going on up there? He said, it's fascinating. The three guys on the left want to tell you the truth. They all, um, they agreed that dispensing justice is hard and they want, they want to help. They want more help from the government and maybe their story could help. The three guys on the other side want to lie to you. They say nothing good can come from telling the story to you. So in the end, the head man looked at me directly and said, we have no idea what you're talking about. I said I understood, but I had come a long way, and would it be okay if I just spent the day in the village to meet some people and get to know the place a little bit? I said, yes, they said. I was welcome to stay for as long as I wanted to. At the end of the day, my interviews proved that what I had heard was true. I interviewed the mother. I interviewed the brother. I met the son. I saw the grave. And a man threatened me with a gun, so we left town very, very quickly. That's a story for another day. Um, that story and the others in the series are the ones that, that won the Pulitzer Prize that, that Kerry mentioned. And President Vicente Fox told us that he used those stories as the basis for a package of reforms that he proposed in Congress to try to fix the criminal justice system. And he said, it's very sad that we have to have outsiders come in here to tell us what's wrong with our own justice system. Um, the Mexican Congress killed those reforms for reasons we can only speculate about, but it raised awareness of problems that many in power in Mexico would rather not discuss. I tell you the story because I do believe there is reason to hope. The work that the Schenker Parliament does is vital. Without your voices telling these stories, telling the truth you see on the ground, the truth you live with every day, nothing will ever change. Your work can create that change. You've sadly suffered violence and even death in your struggle to protect your land and your rights. But I believe that your voices can be the fuel of real and lasting change. I'll close with a quote from Robert F. Kennedy, Kerry's proud father, who was wise beyond compare when it came to human rights. It is from the numberless diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. Each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope 
and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current that can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Congratulations to the, to the Shinka Parliament. Felicidades. I wish you strength and success. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Kevin. Together with 1990 RFK Human Rights Award Laureate Emil Carmendez, our legal team represents the families of indigenous activists who were arrested by the military and disappeared in 1989. The highest human rights court in the Americas will hear that case in just a few months. In February 2022, we visited Guatemala on behalf of our clients. One morning, we took the elevator to the 15th floor of the tribunal's tower, the high rise where the courts meet in Guatemala City. We wound our way into a small crowded office, the chambers of Judge Erica Ifan. She sat reserved, betraying no sign of fear. Judge Ifan was one of the lead judges trying corruption, abuse of power, organized crime, narco trafficking, and immunity, excuse me, and impunity. She had powerful and sadistic enemies. Among others on her docket, she had corruption cases pending against seven of the 13 members of the Supreme Court of Guatemala. A few weeks earlier, she told us she had been falsely accused on trumped up charges. And a few minutes after we met her, she was, appear she was to appear at a hearing during which the court would strip her of her immunity, the last step before they would take her judgeship from her, place her under arrest and throw her in jail alongside the very criminals whose cases she had tried. We followed her to the 10th floor and asked to be able to witness the proceedings, which are legally open to the public, but we were barred entry. Immediately following the hearing, before arrest, Judge Ifan did what dozens of judges and jurists in Guatemala have done before her. She went home, packed a small suitcase, said goodbye to her family, and boarded a flight to the United States. She had no notion of where she would live or work. I am proud to say that thanks to Angelita Bayans and her extraordinary vision, this extraordinary hero has been working at RFK Human Rights ever since that day. Please welcome Dr. Erica Ifan. Buenos días, señora Kerry Kennedy, presidenta de Robert Kennedy Human Rights. Gracias por esa presentación tan bonita que ha hecho. Honorables miembros del Congreso de los Estados Unidos, compañeros y compañeras del Parlamento Xinca, señoras y señores. Quiero comenzar esta mañana citando las siguientes palabras. Cada vez que un hombre defiende un ideal, actúa para mejorar la suerte de otros o lucha contra una injusticia, transmite una diminuta onda de esperanza. Son las palabras de Robert Kennedy que me recuerdan el impacto que tiene en Guatemala el trabajo que realiza el Parlamento Xinca. Para entender ese impacto, es necesario conocer el contexto en el que ellos se desarrollan. Déjenme entonces contarles que Guatemala es un pequeño país de Centroamérica, multietnico, plurilingüe y multicultural. Tiene la economía más grande de los países centroamericanos pero tiene también grandes desigualdades 
económicas y sociales, que cuestan cada día muchas muertes y que nos roban el sueño de un futuro mejor para nuestros niños. Como lo establece, como lo demuestra el índice de desnutrición en el país, que para el año 2020 era de 22.416 niños con desnutrición aguda, 61 fallecimientos, siendo el 69% niños de etnia indígena. Guatemala enfrentó un conflicto armado interno de 36 años, durante el cual implementó la doctrina de seguridad nacional en la que se instauró la noción de enemigo interno que convertía en adversario a cualquier persona que pensara diferente de los gobiernos militares. Esa violencia que generó se calcula que dejó más de 250 mil personas asesinadas, 400 aldeas masacradas y aproximadamente millón y medio de personas que se desplazaron forzadamente. Guatemala puso fin a ese conflicto armado interno con la firma de los acuerdos de paz. Sin embargo, a más de 25 años de ese momento, los compromisos adquiridos por el Estado no se han cumplido, especialmente el acuerdo de identidad y derechos de los pueblos indígenas. Por el contrario, la crisis se ha agravado, poniendo en riesgo la democracia y el Estado de Derecho. Vemos ahora que la historia de la construcción del enemigo y del terror se repite en un campo complejo de interacciones y de poder, en el que el Estado vuelve a la represión y a la violencia sistemática, y el sistema de justicia se instrumentaliza para dejar de perseguir casos de alto impacto vinculados con estructuras nacionales y transnacionales dedicadas al narcotráfico, crímenes de lesa humanidad y corrupción. Para comenzar la persecución política, criminalización, detención arbitraria y exilio contra operadores de justicia, periodistas y defensores de derechos humanos, dentro de los cuales los más atacados han sido los defensores de la tierra. Hoy, la historia de muerte, detenciones ilegales, exilio e impunidad se repite. Y es que el Estado de Guatemala no solo está matando a nuestros niños con desnutrición por corrupción, sino también por ser defensores de la tierra, con ataques armados, como el que cegó la vida a Topacio Reynoso, quien con apenas 16 años de edad era una defensora de derechos humanos. La prensa independiente también está siendo perseguida, al punto que el director del periódico, uno de los diarios más importantes del país, se encuentra detenido. Bajo un proceso penal lleno de irregularidades, aproximadamente ocho de sus abogados defensores han sido perseguidos penalmente y algunos condenados. Se ha ordenado la investigación penal en contra de por lo menos nueve periodistas y columnistas. Y lamentablemente el periódico dejó de circular. Hay también varios fiscales anticorrupción detenidos arbitrariamente. Más de 36 operadores de justicia en el exilio. Solo en Washington habemos aproximadamente siete. Hay dos exfiscales generales de la nación. Y pareciera que no existe esperanza, ya que en el proceso electoral para elegir binomio presidencial, diputados y alcaldes, han sido excluidos candidatos que tenían un fuerte apoyo popular, 
dentro de ellos la única candidata presidencial con pertenencia a una etnia indígena. En ese contexto, es insoslayable los riesgos que enfrentan los miembros del Parlamento Xinca cuando defienden el ideal de un país más justo e inclusivo, cuando actúan para mejorar la suerte de otros a través de la protección del medio ambiente, la tierra, sus derechos y la cultura del pueblo xinca. Cuando luchan contra la injusticia al desafiar el ingreso ilegal de empresas mineras en sus tierras ancestrales. Llevan sus demandas al Sistema de Justicia Nacional guatemalteco y ante la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos, exigiendo que se deduzcan responsabilidades por todas las agresiones sufridas. Exigen su derecho a ser escuchados y que su opinión sea tomada en cuenta. Defienden a quienes han sido criminalizados por su activismo y liderazgo. Y ningún peligro o ataque disminuye la persistencia de su lucha, sus anhelos y convicciones por un país democrático y en paz. Por ello, indudablemente, son el mejor ejemplo de lo que Robert Kennedy dijo un día. Porque con todas las acciones que realizan, le dan a Guatemala una onda de esperanza. Muchas gracias por eso y felicitaciones por tan merecido premio. Un aplauso. Para... Thank you, Judge Ifan. Since colonial times, foreign companies have enriched themselves by stripping indigenous Guatemalans of their natural resources. During the 1960s, US, US and Canadian mining companies secured 40-year concessions and agreements that the Guatemalan military would assure stability among, around the mines. Across the next two decades, While the military carried out an extermination effort against the indigenous people, multinational corporations used that same military to protect their concessions. After the 1996 peace accords, which put an end to the genocide, mining resumed as mainstay of the national economy. Over the next decade, mining concessions grew by 1,000%. As mining increased, so did human rights abuses. The government's failure to protect the rights of indigenous people to their traditional lands led directly to a series of additional abuses. The government and its security forces in collusion with multinational corporations and local mining companies, the Troika of Evil, denied indigenous people's rights to participate in the decision-making process. When indigenous activists protested, the Troika threatened them and subjected them to defamation campaigns, death threats, arbitrary detention, and extrajudicial executions. Too many were forcibly displaced. Those who remain are under constant threat simply for asserting their constitutional rights. These abuses continue today and have been repeated in indigenous communities across Guatemala, nowhere more so than at the, than at the Escapol mining project in the heart of Xinca territory. El Escobal is the second largest silver mine in the world. It's operated by Minura San Rafael, a subsidiary of Canadian multinational Pan American Silver, one of the world's biggest silver producers. Minura San Rafael is renowned for abusive practices in Mexico, Peru, Bolivia, and Argentina. When Minura came to Xinca territory, they followed the same playbook, but they didn't know who they were messing with. The Xinca parliament mobilized against the mine and successfully stopped it for op from opening for seven years. 
When the mine finally opened in 2014, the Shinka parliament organized popular resistance. They closed roads. They lobbied the international community. They sued the government in international courts. In retaliation, Minura and its henchmen used local courts to target the Shinka parliament and hired security forces, including the military and police, who violently suppress the Shinka activists. In 2014, Shinka members Irma and Alexa, excuse me, and Alex Reynoso and their daughter Topacio, activists in the resistance to the mine were threatened and harassed. On April 13th, 2014, assailants opened fire. They wounded Alex and they murdered 16-year-old, their 16-year-old daughter, Tapasio. Please recognize Tapasio's courageous mother, Irma, here with us today. With undaunted courage in the face of this horrific brutality, Tapasio's family and the Shinka parliament continued their protests. In 2017, the Shinka built peaceful encampments on the two roads going into the mine. With the roads blocked, no trucks could access the mine and mining operations came to a complete halt. It was an unprecedented success. Meanwhile, Shinka Parliament lawyers challenged the mining license in court. In 2018, they won. Guatemala's Constitutional Court issued the order to consult and officially suspended operations of the mine. Today, the Escobar mine remains closed and 24-hour encampments are maintained by the Shinka on both access roads to the mine. The consultation process is ongoing. Today, the Chinka Parliament is demanding that the process start from the beginning in order to ensure their full participation and strict adherence to international standards with respect to Shinka's self-determination and their right to free, prior, and informed consent. The fight of the Shinka Parliament against the Escobar mine has not only been a battle for the integrity of their territory, but also a testament to their determination to protect their natural resources and ensure a sustainable future for their communities. Despite threats of imprisonment and death, they continue raising awareness about the environmental and social, social impacts of mining activities, coordinate thousands of members across three regions, mobilize local and international support and challenge the status quo. The, Shink the Shinka have a saying, quote, much strength and good paths to achieve the good living of the Shinka people, unquote. Through the Shinka parliament, we have witnessed the power of resilience, courage, and the unwavering commitment to justice. They remind us that in the face of adversity, we can create transformative change. The Shinka Parliament stands as a model and an inspiration for communities facing similar challenges across the region and around the globe. My father, my father knew that few will have the greatness to bend history itself, but each of us can work to change a small portion of events. And in the total of all these acts will be, the hit, will be written the history of this generation. We thank you for your strength as we present you with the Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Award.
Muchas gracias y muy buenos días. Señora Kerry Kennedy, presidenta de la Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights, honorables miembros del Congreso, compañeros del Parlamento Xinca, señores y señoras, eh, no quiero dejar pasar la oportunidad para saludar también a mis compatriotas que están acá presentes y que están en el exilio únicamente por trabajar a favor de la justicia. Quiero expresar nuestro agradecimiento en nombre del Parlamento Xinca de Guatemala al Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights por el reconocimiento que se nos da como defensores de derechos humanos y defensores de los pueblos indígenas. Esto nos anima, nos motiva a seguir luchando para que se respeten los derechos de los pueblos indígenas. Como Parlamento Xinca tenemos claro que la preservación de nuestro territorio y nuestros bienes naturales son elementos que aseguran la permanencia de nuestro pueblo. El Parlamento Xinca representa la unidad y articulación de las autoridades ancestrales que actuamos bajo el principio que nos heredaron nuestros abuelos, el guiar obedeciendo. La máxima autoridad es la asamblea. Ser defensores y defensoras de derechos humanos en Guatemala es una tarea muy difícil y peligrosa. Muchos somos objeto de persecución, criminalización y algunas veces hasta asesinatos como es el caso, el caso de Topacio Reynoso ex, y exactación Marcos Tucelo, el intento de asesinato de Julio González Arango y el secuestro del Hushi Jurak del pueblo Xinca durante el 2013, el señor Roberto González Ucelo. El pueblo Xinca, a partir del 2009, con la llegada de Minera San Rafael, tuvimos que detener nuestra lucha por la reivindicación en la defensa y para enfocarlos en la defensa de nuestra madre tierra y territorio. Ha sido una tarea muy difícil, ya que, como dije, ha causado asesinatos, secuestros, ataques, encarcelamientos de nuestros hermanos y hermanas. A pesar de los obstáculos, la discriminación, estigmatización y la negación de nuestra existencia por parte del Estado, hoy el pueblo Xinca nos encontramos más vivos que nunca y agradecemos a las energías de los abuelos y abuelas por encontrarnos en este caminar con las personas y organizaciones aliadas como, F, como Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights, que ha contribuido grandemente a nuestra lucha 
o la búsqueda de la justicia. Nos sentimos muy honrados al recibir este premio que es un reconocimiento al esfuerzo y a la lucha de nuestras comunidades del Parlamento Xinca por la defensa del territorio y la reivindicación de nuestros derechos, principalmente de nuestro derecho al consentimiento previo, libre e informado. Es un reconocimiento a todas las personas y organizaciones de una u otra forma han contribuido a nuestra lucha. Este premio también representa para nosotros un gran compromiso para continuar luchando con más fuerza por los derechos humanos, especialmente por los derechos de los pueblos indígenas. Reiteramos nuestro agradecimiento en nombre del Parlamento Xinca a Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights y pedimos continuar trabajando de la mano. a nuestros compañeros que están siguiendo este acontecimiento allá en Casillas, allá en Mataquescuintla. Compañeros, aquí tenemos el premio por esa gran labor, ese gran sacrificio por defender nuestra tierra, nuestro territorio, nuestros bienes que son naturales, que para nosotros son muy importantes. Ustedes tienen un gran país. Yo viví aquí en los 90. Hace unos días me preguntaba una hermana de, de la iglesia que si me arrepentía de haberme ido para mi país. A estas alturas, pues, fuera residente o ciudadano de acá, de Estados Unidos pero no me arrepiento. Aquí trabajé para ganar dinero. En mi país trabajo para obtener justicia, para que se respeten nuestros derechos como pueblos indígenas, para que mi pueblo y los pueblos de Guatemala podamos tener una vida digna. Todos nos merecemos vivir bien porque a esta tierra venimos a ser felices. Lástima que hay personas que no lo entienden y son felices haciendo el daño. Nuestro total repudio también para esa gente. Reitero, estoy muy emocionado, muy contento y sabemos que hay personas que también ya perdieron la vida por defender los derechos humanos y los derechos de los seres de todo pues de toda la vida de los bienes naturales también porque hoy estamos en una situación difícil con el cambio climático si no actuamos ¿Dónde vamos a vivir? Somos nosotros que trabajamos para eso. Todos deberíamos de hacerlo. Pero desde los pueblos indígenas, con esa conexión que tenemos con la Madre Tierra, sabemos que tenemos que seguirlo haciendo. Nuevamente, muy agradecido por este premio. Muchas gracias. Que Tiguish los bendiga.
Muy buenas tardes para todos y todas. Mi nombre es Irma Pacheco. My name is Irma Pacheco. En, en nombre de las mujeres chincas, quiero agradecer este premio que reconoce el esfuerzo y el sufrimiento de, de las mujeres del pueblo chinca, las cuales hemos luchado por muchos años por defender el legado de nuestros abuelos y nuestras abuelas, por defender nuestra madre, madre tierra, esa madre que al igual que nosotras las mujeres da vida. Este premio es un reconocimiento a todos los hermanos y hermanas que han sido encarcelados y perseguidos. Aquellos hermanos y hermanas que se nos han adelantado en la lucha. A quienes han sido víctimas de ataques, de secuestros. A quienes el Estado de Guatemala ha humillado y pisoteado simplemente por reclamar nuestros derechos. Es un reconocimiento a todos esos hombres, mujeres, niños y niñas abuelos y abuelas, que soñamos con una justicia y el ejercicio pleno de nuestro derecho al territorio. Invito a cada hombre, mujer y niño del mundo a alzar la voz por la justicia, que no nos cansemos de luchar hasta lograr un mundo en el que se respeten los derechos humanos, un mundo en el que los pueblos origina originarios podamos gozar libremente de nuestro territorio y de nuestra madre tierra. Nos llevamos este premio con el firme compromiso de seguir luchando con más fuerza para defender nuestros derechos y los derechos de los demás. Muchas gracias a Robert F. Kennedy y Human Rights por contribuir a nuestra lucha y motivarnos con este premio. Les pedimos seguir de la mano con nosotros en este caminar tan difícil y pues que viva el pueblo Xinca hoy, mañana y siempre. También que viva Robert F. Kennedy por la defensa de los derechos humanos. Muchas gracias. Thank you for those. Um, beautiful and inspiring words. We're here at the United States Senate, a place which makes so many decisions that impact our earth, our communities, our capacity to thrive, and the spiritual direction of our country with the implications across the world. It's up to all of us to hear the words of these extraordinary human beings today, to take them to our hearts and do everything we can to create the change, not only for the Shinka people who live in a remote part of the world on our stopping a mine in Guatemala, but for the protection of democracy and justice and our land and our spiritual heritage and the wisdom of our ancestors in this country and across the globe. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.